As indicated, my name is Alina Zahobie, and I'm the Dean of Faculty of Human Sciences at NAST. We are very pleased to be part of this collaboration, if among other things, because it has shown that despite the COVID pandemic, the lockdown, closure of borders, that knowledge can transcend beyond the limitations of human movement. We're very pleased to collaborate with the University of Northwest, principally because as two faculties of human sciences, humanities and social science disciplines, we found that we had a lot in common and that we could actually speak to something which is a global development challenge in this instance pandemic. One of the things that many of you will have witnessed in the last few weeks since when the lockdown started in Southern Africa was that the plight of many in our communities was highlighted. The lack of access to clean water, shelter, the hunger that has befallen most of our people became very apparent. In this respect, it is clear that biomedical approaches will not help us deal with the pandemic. So as people who work, practice and are activists in the human and social sciences, it was important that we also begin to respond to this challenge. And I'm very pleased that colleagues at the University of Northwest and colleagues who are in cognate areas, including our partner institutions, so it fits that we can come together, develop this program which is a series of six webinars. It comes in the fold of our attempts to look at other ways of collaborating. In this instance, partnering to look at possible grants for our research in the human and social sciences. In this seminar, I'm really pleased that we've got a whole range of experts and community practitioners who will, among other things, share with us their own understanding of the impact of the uh, corona pandemic on their activism on their scholarship, and of course, broadly speaking, on our human development as a community. I myself will perhaps in due course share with you some of my own thoughts in my own area of research. As an archaeologist, I'm very aware that pandemics are not new. As probably our keynote speaker will allude to, the Egyptian civilization has given us insights into the impact of pandemics more than 3,000 years ago. We know that medicine was not founded only in the 19th century in Europe, but has a longer history on the continent of Africa. From a very Africanist lens, I'm looking forward to seeing how we can unpack some of the issues that inform the idea of medical or social, medical, psychosocial solutions to pandemics. At the end of the day, the pandemic affects us as human beings. So I'm looking forward to hearing views from linguists, literary practitioners, especially artists who've been very hardly uh, um, undone by the pandemic in that they're not able to do what they do best in terms of that trait, go out there and perform. But through technology, we've also found new ways of engaging, of uh, interacting. So I'm also pleased that in this context, we are able to commune together and to be able to share our thoughts as a global, humanity. So through these webinars, we are hoping we can bring you closer to the subjects and especially not to dwell too much on the adverse impacts of the pandemic, but to look at possible ways of engaging and begin to reshape and reimagine our common future. Now with these few words, I can only say welcome. From the viewpoint of NAST, we really look forward to this. You can imagine that uh, we are thousands of kilometers perhaps apart those of us who are in Windhoek are looking forward to hearing more from what is happening in the Northwest province of South Africa through our collaboration with uh, Prof. Maseko and her team on this project. Prof, thank you very much for giving me the floor and I really look forward to the next few minutes and uh, perhaps next couple of hours of sessions in the month of August and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Alena. Um, now I would like to um, just um, ask uh, the acting Deputy Vice Chancellor Research and Innovation from um, Northwest University, Professor Franz Wander, to give a message of support. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, 
Ladies and gentlemen, it's nice to know that this collaboration has reached across country boundaries. And first of all, I want to send greetings from Prof. Dan Kwade, our Vice Chancellor. Due to work schedule, he could not make it, but he sends his regards. I spoke to him earlier this uh, morning, and he trusts that this collaboration will extend and increase the knowledge uh, areas. I've just switched off from a ESCOM EPI uh, meeting to ensure that the lights are kept on and we trust uh, we will not have those problems, but welcome especially to the um, Namibia University of Science and Technology, Prof. Uh, Sigubai, and of course, Prof. Pamela Maseko from the Northwest University, who already uh, welcomed everyone. And I feel humbled to be amongst you to listen what is being said uh, and what is important. One of the most important drivers in our university is internationalization. And not only with European or American countries, but mainly African countries. That does the better that uh, we are sitting with our neighbors in Namibia and uh, Northwest University. And it started with one faculty in uh, NAST, one faculty in uh, NWU, and it has grown. And I can see almost 100 participants are listening. And I trust that this afternoon and the couple of weeks to come, important issues will be dealt with. To increase our knowledge, uh, to ensure that we understand pandemics, uh, as was already mentioned in Africa and Egypt and older times, they did occur. And I trust that this um, COVID-19 insights from the humanities, social sciences, and indigenous knowledge systems, a perspective from the global south, would benefit each and every one, that we can learn from what is taught. Thus, I want to acknowledge again both the executive deans from uh, Namibia and from uh, Northwest, and I trust that this collaboration will continue and grow to the better. I thus once again want to wish you well for the remainder of this webinar and those to come. All the best and congratulations with the work already done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Prof. Uh, Franz. Thanks for the words of encouragement um, and that message of support. Um, Prof. Um, Alina, I now hand over to you. Um, to say a few words um, also on behalf of the DVC Research and Innovation from NAST. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Maseko. Um, on behalf of uh, the Acting Vice Chancellor of Namibia University of Science and Technology, uh, Dr. Andrew Nikondo, and on behalf of the listed speaker, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research and Innovation, Professor Pramanathan Govenda. I'm sharing this message on his behalf because unfortunately he could not join us. He has an urgent meeting, as you know, with the challenges of the pandemic, there are crisis meetings that tend to take our principles away. So he, sh he shares his very deepest uh, apologies for not joining us this afternoon. However, on his behalf, I share this message Prof wanted to highlight that we are not new to collaborating with the University of Northwest. In fact, we have a standing memorandum of understanding, which has been in existence and which in fact is due for renewal next year. We also have a partnership with the Faculty of Natural Resources and Spatial Sciences at NAST and Northwest University, which is a project focused partnership with Gießen University in Germany. It is clear that over the last few years, these collaborations have given us a lot that we can go by in terms of new projects, innovative ideas, and new avenues for partnerships and grant raising. 
it is clear from our side as a science and technology university that the humanities are very important and core to our research. In fact, our very mission highlights that we are an engaged and responsive university which aims to meet the need of stakeholders through excellent education, applied research, and innovation and services. So with this, we have been looking at ways in which we can innovate around partnerships, including how we can collaborate for community-based engagement. We look forward to this series as the way in which through the research and innovation office can begin our broad Namibian landscape where we keep solving approaches towards the current and contemporary and possibly future challenges that we may be facing. Given the COVID pandemic, a lot of our efforts currently will be focused on COVID-19 focused research. However, we are also aware that research in the future may need to go beyond that. So we are looking at how we can begin to diversify our research portfolio. Among other areas where we are focusing is area of indigenous knowledge systems. This will include colleagues from the Faculty of Human Sciences, colleagues who are already doing research in communities, including indigenous communities in Namibia, from the Faculty of Computer and Informatics. We are looking at ways in which we can enrich our transdisciplinary research, and especially to ensure that throughout our engagement, we can be more inclusive, not only of communities, but of other stakeholders. In this instance, the private sector and the public sector. We are now going through difficult financial times, not only in Namibia, but globally. With the reduced funding in the global landscape, it is important that we find new and innovative ways of raising resources. This partnership shows us that we can actually do a lot with very little. So it is my pleasure to look at how we can grow these kinds of partnerships and deepen the relationships. I'm pleased that some of our own staff members are students at the Northwest University. I'm told that there are students who are studying for their doctoral degrees at Northwest University, and some may be coming more to other disciplines at your institution. In this regard, we will be deepening our collaborations. It is also important to note that as neighbors, we share a lot that is not only opportunities, but also challenges. We've seen in the last few weeks, increased cross-border cases of COVID-19. This should not deter us from continuing our partnerships, but I believe that with these challenges will also come solutions. So I wish you and the rest of the webinar a very good starting point and look forward to hearing more about this, how this seminar series will enhance our growing partnerships. I thank you. And that is the message from the Deputy Vice Chancellor in Innovation, Professor Governor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, um, Prof. Elena, for the message from the DVC. Um, our next speaker is Prof. Nelesi Khabi. Um, unfortunately, Prof. Nelesi cannot be here, could not be here, but has sent his message uh, through a, a video link. Um, are you able to share that with us? Prof. Nelesi is the um, director in the Office of Research um, in the university. Thank you. Good afternoon. Program Director, uh, let me start by acknowledging the executive management of the Northwest University represented by uh, the DVC RNI, Professor Franz Wanders, and the executive management of the Namibia University of Science and Technology represented by the DVC RNI, Professor Govenda. Uh, I also like to acknowledge the keynote speaker, Dr. Onk Chavalala, who is the director for indigenous knowledge-based technology innovation in the Department of Science and Technology. 
uh, the executive deans, Professor Alina Sehubje, Faculty of Human Sciences at NAST, and Prof. Pamela Maseko from Faculty of Humanities at the NWU, Dr. Motelko Itziwi, researcher from the NWU IKS Center. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for organizing this and uh, initiating or rather resuscitating the partnership between the two institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, the rationale for partnership and collaboration between Northwest University and NAST centers around engagement in research that has an impact in the community, a research that speaks more to the livelihoods. And we also center the activities around internationalization of research. So the NWU and NAST partnership started during the era of the Polytechnic of Namibia, which is now NAST, the University of Northwest and the Pojostrum University, which are now together, the Northwest University. The agreements signed and implemented to date include the MOU between NAST and the Maiken campus of the Northwest University, signed in December 2015. One of the aims of the agreement was to encourage and promote collaborative research activities between staff members in order to promote the generation of knowledge and development of the institutions in their respective society. Implementation of the strategy to promote internationalization of research has been realized at different levels including the trilateral agreement signed in April 2016 between NAST, JLU in Germany and the Northwest University. There are ongoing discussions to include JLU in this particular project that is COVID-19 and insights from humanities, social science and IKS. Of course then that would not have the global South um, the Intra-Africa Academic Mobility Program is also a good example of the successful partnership programs between NAST and the NWU. This uh, program uh, focused more on academic mobility and um, we, we actually had an opportunity in this partnership to have the exchanges that were based on research, that is where staff moved to another institution to access research facilities. The Faculty of Humanities has also been active in the partnership aimed to promote engaged research with significant impact on the policy formulation and implementation in the two countries. A recent example is the visit by the research entities in the Faculty of Humanities, particularly uh, Optensia. So a team uh, from Optensia, a team of researchers visited Namibia in March this year, just before the lockdown, and connected with NAST, UNAM, and several ministries, including the Ministry of Labor, Industrial Relations, and Employment Creation, uh, the Ministry of Sport, Youth and National Science Service, and the Ministry of Health. Uh, the visit also um, included discussions with the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, and representatives from business and uh, labor sectors to discuss engagement in joint research and development programs. Moving forward, ladies and gentlemen, may I propose the signing of a new memorandum of understanding between the two institutions by our DVCs before the end of 2020. The reason being that the current MOU between NAST and NWU is coming to an end in December this year. And we will have an opportunity to have now 
the MOU signed under two uh, um, institutions, the NWU now under the Unitary model, not campus uh, based, and the Namibia University of Science and Technology under the newly uh, established office of the GVC RNI. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so with Prof Nenesi in here, absentia, we, we now go to um, the performance um, part of the webinar. Um, uh, we have uh, Ms. Mandisa Nomalanga, who is a, a poet. Um, Mandisa um, hails from a small town um, of Tomo, um, in the Eastern Cape. She is a composer, writer, African indigenous musician, a guitar player, beat crafter, a poet uh, who performs in two languages. She's Kosa by origin and, he, and grew up here in Kettle in her village. Um, he has got two books that are due for publication in the near future. Amongst the other accomplishments is that she was a praise poet for the former president, um, Tabo Mbeki and also was a poet in the Northwest House of Traditional um, Leaders. She has her own traditional band called Mandisa and Uwambo, which was nominated for a Satma Award um, in 2009. Um, over to you, um, Sis Mandisa. Paul, is Mandisa with us? So if Mandisa is not with us, Paul, would you be able to play the pre-recorded uh, poem? Thank you. Zapo, njinkunz matoteza. Hakau kuchinga bantu na bezala zapo ngi nkunzi matote zanzi kwe kaka zata ifika ngi kalele kili COVID-19 kuli zweka zile Afrika no mshaba hongu pela punguza wena pungu pungu utale ngoja upunguza kwa koko betu mshazani kusha yezi tukile na mshanji mpiko zento otoviani zipapa zikauke ziti saa espaka pakeni kwe uhini matota kwa nake ele kusaleni Corona, ha, we nyeke, ususlonda setolo, um tinsua coliso telikul, um tuak vulum lomonga uchu sheku and the king at tebe tu kinja, haku vala kwa konu sheku kuvelenu nama jungu jungu, queu, yes baso peka, pina tea, cotta singa peki oku, si fasi ni esitumza ubo mi busheke bunangati, jengen in the emboji. Zafa za peli zizwe matota. Zikichwa incholongo wa neito ebe ya uchopeshe ya kwa maluante. Nangoku sisi ten ngokoto. Sichonge kumongameli no nonta lonte. Kobi inga baba pete ingu kata iteveche. Kaloku isi kwebu sombo na si mandi ngoo tujelano. Kela ante ramapo sanjela ante. Kela ante zuli mkiza njela ante. Sitikuni hunchu. Kenya yesi ancha eni bale kenga sona uboni kwa ngongo litili zindonga. Likinya izizwe. Shambani zandla kengu kuni kukuta. Nizivalele kunguna se zindin. Kalo kubatetile no noma totolo noma bona kute. But stay home, stay safe. Wash your hands frequently. Wear your mask. Ukuza so yisele ncholongwani. Nde ram. Nde kiliki. Kine kirile kia itiri mala. Kale muka hasa wita belibu hiri hiri. Kake sati ki utle ka peho ye tiriri kuto kwa musija. Kote kana peho ye hetu kile sibo du ibo di ili. Le runare skera hemela na kale runare tabola. Ijak! Kana khatu le ene wa akulecha. Buidi idi bu hule ribu muidi tuwe kisi khajaja sa korona sa sa sisi muki moto mala. Kirata uye sina mpilu to muki. Bansule basu uye jaye tawina imeza isa emisi. 
kari khutsi le mo hikela go sa tlwaele segang o le thi ya reng go wela motho le thi nne le thi le thi le tse botshilo jwa motho le bo matota sa mbatha ba e makadina o ka le bana ba ba tswa motho ntamo ya pala e hubitse a tabogathelela ja ka mosima no wa malobo o sa diweng ke banyana mo ditseleng ka ibile ile morudi so mo golo wa khadi ya seretse ibile le monkhomo na ti wa dipilisi a e makadina o rama phosa tsho ba le bonele ha tse ka bo phara ra be ra sala rena le tsholohelo he ba khetsu a ke le retse mahoko a ga tautona thapa matso go khapetsa khapetsa e tswelele mmo matlunye seri gong la tlogala ga sa kokwana thuko ye ba khaetso kana go hara a swa ranyelela nyena bo matwetwe a ke le meng ka dinao lo botse marapo tse di suleng gore tota ga te go senyegile kae lo tlhatleng thuko ya poma khabinyana le monepe nepe e tle re go goduma ka moso phakela re tsoge re ntsa matlo di khapeng ka re tla be re ikutlwa re le botoka nyena ba majalo re iketlele mpele ka go tlhola le khokhosetsa bontlo kana nta kunyesa ka no se le re bolwetse gae kana ngwana a makhakha o hitlwa a tsela la bo lo batla gore roga ka lo re lo nyorilwe thank you um very much mandisa um again the um colleagues are uh, those who don't understand either sikosa or setswana um, in our culture, we say poets' words um, are untranslatable, um, but I'm sure you felt the emotions and understood um, what she was trying to convey to us. Um, and now um, I come to the um, climax um, of the day. Um, it is a great privilege uh, for me to introduce the keynote speaker for the day. Dr. Chabalala, um, Dr. Ang Hlupeka Chabalala. Dr. Chabalala is the director of the Indigenous Knowledge Based Technology Innovation Unit of the Department of Science and um, Innovation. He is a medical scientist with special interest in research, development, and innovation of African natural medicines, cosmeceuticals, nutraceuticals. You can tell I'm not a a biomedical um, scholar, health infusions and technology transfer for socioeconomic development. He's an applied epidemi epidemiologist and African medicine practitioner with a passion for ancient scientific African and Afro-Asian healing arts. He holds a master of science um, at the, from the University of Pretoria, master of public health from Tsinghua um, University, and a PhD in technology innovation at Da Vinci Institute of, Net of Technology. He serves on the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority. Dr. Shabalala, we're privileged to have you address us as a first keynote speaker in the series. We look forward to your presentation titled Knowledge Based Technology Innovation. So the future, sorry, let me just um, repeat, uh, repeat that again. We are looking forward to your presentation titled The Future of African Medicine in, Epi in, Edi in Epidemic Preparedness and Response. Over to you, um, Dr. Chabalala. Um, thank you so much, um, Prof. Maseko. Uh, I think before I start, I'll also like to <clears throat> to thank colleagues from uh, Namibia, uh, uh, Professor Sihovie, but also the, the acting um, vice chancellor, uh, Professor Funders, and my dear brother that we journeyed together uh, as we were trying to institutionalize uh, indigenous knowledge systems in this country, uh, Dr. Goitziwe. Um, and I would also like to greet uh, everyone that is uh, um, on this webinar. Uh, as Prof. Maseko said, my work really is around indigenous knowledge-based technology innovation. Um, uh, I should also maybe mention that within our Department of Science and Innovation, there are three indigenous knowledge systems unit. There is a unit on policy and advocacy, which looks into everything policy and legislative. Uh, and then there's another sister unit which looks into knowledge management 
this is the unit that then looks into maybe part of the theme for today, which looks into archives and, uh, and knowledge and um, whatever information that uh, our people have, have uh, developed over the years. Now, my unit is, of course, on uh, indigenous knowledge-based technology innovation, and I'll demonstrate uh, what that means and how that looks like. <clears throat> um, when I was requested to give a talk, I was a little bit reluctant because the, the theme was around history and archiving, and these are not necessarily uh, areas of my strength, uh, but my, uh, our host said, no, nope, I have to just share what I do and um, what my passion is in relation to the, to the general uh, theme around, around the webinar. Uh, <clears throat> now I'll just quickly share my screen. Uh, before I go further, I would like to also recognize um, uh, one of our indigenous knowledge holders. Uh, his name is Babama Bena, Trebisama uh, Bena, who was honored last week. He was the winner of the National Science and Technology Forum Awards. Uh, this is the first indigenous knowledge holder that actually pocketed a prize uh, or prizes that are often reserved for, for professors and doctors and scientists. Uh, so he really demonstrated uh, to, to those that were um, choosing people that were supposed to be awarded that uh, in his own way he is indeed a scientist that uses indigenous knowledge systems, especially the interfacing of nature, of biodiversity with indigenous knowledge and the various um, uh, fields of science, be it botany, be it pharmacology, be it chemistry. So, so we really um, like to, to, to honor him uh, in this case as well, uh, that there are so many like him and I trust that as years go on, most of them will be recognized as he, he was. Now, uh, what is it that I'll focus on? I will focus on um, a little bit on the history of epidemics uh, and the use of natural medicines. Um, and of course, honing it home uh, to, to the African continent. And I then, I'll then um, look into the potential of African medicines in general um, whether it's in terms of socioeconomic development, but most importantly, linking it to, to uh, the health or the clinical applications of uh, these medicines. I will then, uh, of course, connect this to the, to the, to the pandemics of the past, um, uh, from an antiquity until today. And I'll end up by sharing a little bit about the work that we're doing within the Department of Science and Innovation uh, in terms of how we, we're dealing with the pandemic, but within the context of research, development, and innovation. And there are some of the uh, conclude, concluding recommendations, and a, a few of them uh, are linked to, to universities, especially yourselves, um, you know, the University of the Northwest and um, Namibia University of Science and uh, Technology. I should also mention that our department has a bilateral agreement with Namibia. And there has been um, time that some of my colleagues spent time in Namibia, uh, assisting Namibia to come up with its own indigenous knowledge systems uh, policy. And I think Dr. Muteo was part of some of the people that, that contributed towards assisting some of our colleagues uh, in the African continent. <clears throat> now, some of you who have been part of uh, the previous talk that I gave a couple of months ago, I started off here with this principle of science and, um, and medicines or everything knowledge. This principle is called Tehuti or Neter Tehuti. Um, uh, this picture that you're seeing uh, is from the temple, uh, one of the ancient African temple or university temples uh, in, in, in ancient Egypt, the one that we prefer to call Kemet as the people called it Kemet. Um, 
So in a little village called Abydos or Aptu, there is a beautiful, well-preserved temple where in one of the chapels, you find uh, this principle called Teuti. And you can see he's carrying an onk, which is a symbol of life. Now Teuti was um, a principle of knowledge, of wisdom, of science, uh, all forms of science, including arts, um, 64 types of arts. And of course, um, a medicine was part of the, the principles that uh, um, uh, this, this being called Teuti uh, uh, bestowed upon our people. I should also maybe mention here, because if you go into history book, they will say the God of this. This had nothing to do with us. We never looked at this as any God. It was just our way of projecting out, outwardly uh, how we viewed certain principles that had to do with wisdom. Just as in, 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 in mathematics, you have formulas. Uh, in chemistry or biochemistry, we have chemical formulas. So basically what you're seeing in this picture um, or in this picture, the, all those glyphs that you're seeing are various formulas that our ancestors actually um, uh, 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 presented their, their knowledge uh, 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 through. I think I should also mention that not everything that I'll talk about today comes from, uh, from my department. Uh, a big chunk of the work comes from my institute, which is called the Amen Ra Institute, which then looks uh, basically into the ancient Egyptian, ancient Nubian um, uh, knowledge systems, uh, which then are interfaced into modern sciences uh, for us to then apply these things for us to, to have um, thriving life. <clears throat> In terms of the history of epidemics and pandemics, um, the biggest one that most of us know about or heard about was in the 12th century. Uh, and this is what was called the Black Death, which almost exterminated uh, half of, the, of, of, of Europe, of Western Europe. Uh, however, part of this epidemic uh, started in the Far East. So it, it really went all the way through Russia and the Middle East as well. However, there were seven other pandemics in the ancient times, uh, for example, um, uh, smallpox killed up to 50, 56 million people. Uh, the Black Death killed up to 200 million people. Um, and the, there has been other flu-related epidemics like the Spanish flu, the Ant Antonian, uh, 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 sorry, the, the, the Russian flu, the Asian flu, the Hong Kong flu, all these influ uh, flu-like uh, uh, pandemic and epidemics most of them started in the Far East as it is the case today with COVID. Uh, and also in 2003, SARS also started in China. <clears throat> um, we also had cholera, which killed up to a million people uh, in the, 18, in the 18, uh, uh, early 1880s, but it, it, cholera usually lasts for longer. When you have cholera, you rest assured that this kind of uh, epidemic or pandemic will last up to five years. Uh, I was the head of emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases um, uh, early, late 1990, 1999 up to 2003, four, when we had cholera in South Africa, we had over 200,000 cases. However, our death rate was very low. It was less than 0 0.02. So here I'm just demonstrating that uh, epidemics and pandemics have always been with humanity and they will always be with humanity, especially when it comes to uh, situations where we as humanity um, uh, mess up with nature, where we do not respect the, the loss of nature, how nature is supposed to be taken care of. Um, uh, almost all pandemics, except the ones that are are man-made, uh, especially if you look into smallpox in South America. These are the these are some of the pandemics which were were brought about by the conquistadores. Uh, these are these the Spanish invaders that went into South America, and then they laced the blankets uh, with smallpox uh, virus, and they gave these blankets to the natives of South America, 
And of course, we, most of you might have heard about um, uh, what is called biological warfare, the problems that we have had in the Middle East, like in Iraq uh, and today uh, in Iran, um, uh, the war that these two countries are having with the with the with the with the Western countries, often uh, biological warfare uh, is the issue, because some countries then use uh, these biological agents um, to kill people, and we have got our own Doctor Death uh, in the in the name of um, voter person. I guess he's still going through some some court cases where he was also involved in um, poisoning some of our freedom fighters. And in the process, you have small outbreaks, whether it's in the family or in the community. Um, there are also records, uh, especially when it comes to the to the to the uh, three uh, influenza-based epidemics that I spoke about, like the Asiatic, the Russian, the Australian, and the Spanish flu. There are records that during this time, during this these epidemics, um, most of the countries actually used natural remedies. Um, and uh, the latest publication uh, is in the book uh, by Francis B um, Brinker. Uh, this book was published in 2007, whereby they talk about how many, what kind of herbs were used during what type of uh, pandemic throughout the continent, throughout the, the, the globe. And the table below um, is actually a list of some of the herbs that have been used uh, uh, during pandemics, and these herbs were actually used by um, they were used by um, by physicians. It wasn't just uh, natural medicines practitioners that were using this. They were used by your normal doctors. In Africa, <clears throat> um, I mentioned during my previous talk that, of course, as Africans, we are the first ones to come up with writing. And the, the brown things that you're seeing on your right, these are the papyrus from which the name paper comes from. And the various papyrus ranging from um, uh, as old as almost 3,000 years ago, um, uh, let me say 5,000 years ago, 3,000 years BC, some of the papyrus actually talk about the various pandemics that that actually occurred on the African continent, especially uh, down the Nile Valley. Uh, we experienced plague, we experienced cholera, we experienced leprosy, we experienced uh, malaria, um, and a whole host of other uh, pandemic. It is said that the gentleman on the, on the left, Imhotep or Imhotep, as some of you will know, know him by, he treated over 200 conditions, and most of these conditions uh, were of internal medicine nature, meaning that they had everything to do to do with pests and pestilence. Uh, this is the old, old name, which means uh, infectious diseases, um, be they bacterial, viral, or fungal. But it wasn't only men. We also had women, since we are in the, in the month of women. We also had two most famous ladies, Peseshet, um, who was a contemporary of Imhetep, and Merit Ptah, who lived around the time of Hesi Ra uh, on top, the gentleman on top, who was Less of the mysteries uh, than women, uh, and this has been um, uh, uh, demonstrated. <clears throat> the lady that you're seeing on the screen, um, her name is Kerudu Ong. This is actually the mother of Imhetep. Uh, Imhetep is the gentleman that I spoke about, and uh, the picture on the right, that's him sitting on the chair or on the throne, and you can see he's carrying a scroll, meaning that around his time, which was 2700 BC, 
already we had papers, already we had books we were writing, but we give thanks to this mother, to this black woman who actually gave birth to such a multi-genius. But also I, I prefer to, to, to talk about uh, this concept of tep chesed, especially to those who are in the indigenous knowledge system, but they are too averse to, to modern science and technology or everything that is scientific. I would like to say to them that actually we are the ones that came up with science as I demonstrated that we had a principle, a natural principle, which was responsible for science and everything knowledge and wisdom. Now, when we look into one papyrus, Prese papyrus, which is locked somewhere in France in a museum, uh, we find a book. Uh, this book is it's called The Maxims and Teachings of Ptahotep. This gentleman that you're seeing here, his name was Ptahotep and he lived 2,375 BC. So almost 4,300 years ago. Um, in this book, um, the first paragraphs of this book, he talks about what he calls Tep Chesep En Medu Neter Nefert, which means the correct methods or the, the correct methods of having excellent reasoning or discourse when you investigate nature. And he goes on to explain this to his, to his disciples that it's important to be systematic. You can't, you can't just say, I'm, I have faith or I believe or, or use superstition. Everything needs to be systematically explained. Nothing is mysterious. Nothing is mystical. Nothing is metaphysical. Everything can be explained. When we don't know, we shouldn't make up stories. So this is what he was saying. However, almost a thousand years later, we see this gentleman at the left-hand corner. His name was called Ameshu or Ames. Some will say Ames, but um, uh, uh, I use old Egyptian system. So I call him Ameshu. He was actually copying an old papyrus into a new papyrus. The one that you see at the um, bottom uh, corner. He was copying this papyrus, which was uh, a mathematical papyrus. And in this papyrus, there are over 80 mathematical problems. And these problems range from geometry to algebra, to trigonometry, to integral and calculus aspects of mathematics. That's why we could build the things that we build. And here actually you can see some of the triangles already in the, in the papyrus. However, the first line of this papyrus also talk about this thing called tep hesep, which is the correct methods. Um, and if you look into the English translation of what I've put here, you will see that this is what we use in the so-called scientific methods. Uh, especially those of us who come from the natural sciences. But I like to believe that also in history, um, you also have methodologies. So basically, TEP HESEP is the correct methodologies of investigating any and everything. We can't just um, uh, thumb suck or use the things that I said, especially when it comes to African knowledge system. We are, we are often accused that um, African knowledge system is just about beliefs and faith. That is not true. Our ancestors were not like that. I'm, I may say that we have actually devolved from where we were to where we are today because of many reasons. Um, slavery, colonialism, endless invasions, apartheid. Um, these are all the systems that work very hard so that we forget and we never went ahead and developed our own knowledge systems. Um, when it comes to the records of um, uh, medical records, there are all these papyrus and this is just a few of them. There are so many papyrus that are still locked up in Paris, in Britain, in, 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 um, in Italy, in the US, in Canada. Basically all the museums of the world I, I can bet my bottom dollar, museums, the biggest museums of the world have more African 
uh, artifacts than their own artifacts. Um, we are the most studied uh, than any other civilization in the world. <clears throat> and um, I'll just quickly brush through this uh, slide where I, uh, I'm often accused that why, why always Kemet, why always Egypt? Here, I just wanted to demonstrate that if, if, if you looked into, so basically what they did, the, some of the scientists, especially Professor Soy Keita, who I really adore so much, this, this amazing Cambridge professor, African professor, he, they looked into a number of mummies, especially the 18 dynasty mummies, and then what they found is that this mummies had a marker. It's called E1B1A. It's a haplogroup which shows you who your ancestors are. But also from that, you can also tell who the descendants are. And from this table, you can see that Southern African nations are actually um, re related to those ancient Egyptian, especially of the the, the of the 18 dynasty, which was actually the third golden age in ancient Egypt. <clears throat> um, and there is those of you who like reading, there is a there is a there, one of the papers which detail this story that I'm talking about um, uh, was written by uh, it was published by the Biomedical Journal in 2012. But there are many other journals that came out after that. I think this was re rewritten in 2018. And here in this journal, actually, they then demonstrate um, this, this haplogroup. It's also called EM2, this genetic marker. So, so, so they then took the genetic mark, the genetic uh, material of Tut Ankh Amen's grandparents, his, mater his maternal parents and his paternal parents. And all of them were over 90% Sub Saharan Africa. Of course, that part of the world, there was a little bit of admixture because of people who were coming from the Levant, uh, like uh, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Mitannis. However, all these people were over 90% uh, Sub-Saharan, but I can also add they were, they were over 90% Bantu because they were related to, to us in the South more than anyone on the African continent. Now, when it comes to COVID, um, we have, we're facing a problem. We are at 18, maybe today we may be having 19 million cases already and over, over half a million death. And as you can see, the number of cases are closely related to some of the biggest epidemics that the world has had uh, in, the, in the few slides that I had. And in South Africa, we are over half a million cases with almost 10,000 dead already. And the biggest challenge is that there are no solutions today. The only solution that is not really helping us is personal hygiene. To a certain extent, it's, it's, it's helping. The diagnostic in terms of the testing, there are still problems with tests. Um, then there are, no there are no therapies, whether in terms of African medicines, there are no vaccines. And of course, <clears throat> um, the are uh, the the issues of immunity and most most people most scientists are not talking about immunity there are those who are saying well the immune system is the one that kills you because of the cytokine storm but in our work as i'll demonstrate in the next five minutes uh there, there are some of the solutions that we're finding out which are related to immune modulation um quickly i wanted to just demonstrate that our country is the third most biodiverse country in the world with, re with regards to, to medicines. Um, we have over 300,000 health practitioners. And last year, our um, Sun, 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 Bi Sun B, um, our institute there, the South African Biodiversity Institute demonstrated that uh, our biodiversity can give us a market value of over 2 billion rands per annum. So, so there is some competitive advantage in terms of what we have in the country. But also we know that more than 72% of South Africans use African medicines. Uh, more than 27, 27 million of our people spend up to 8% 8, 8 of their annual income on African medicines services, meaning that they visit Sangomas 
almost 50, more than 50% of our people spend more than up to 8% 8, 8 of their, of their, of their um, salaries on, on Sangoma work. Um, uh, and today we're talking about cannabis, which is a 70, up to 73 billion US dollars. And fortunate enough, we're doing something about that. And we have all types of teas, which are up to, uh, the teas are actually more than cannabis in terms of their market, market value. I wanted to also just quickly demonstrate that medicines, plant-based medicines have been used uh, in the development of some of the well-known medicines like Tamiflu, penicillin, artemisinin, taxol, metformin for diabetes, and cyclosporin. So, 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 so there is potential in African medicines because this, these products are being used uh, in, in developing mod, so-called modern day medicines. And we have studied enough. We know we know which centers uh, um, African medicines target in the body or in the cells. So we don't have to worry about that. And we even are uh, discovering even more. In South Africa, we have um, a program. We call it the IK Base Bioinnovation Program. This is the program which I had. It has got these six platforms, and one of the platforms is on natural medicine. And it is this natural medicines platform, which is actually responsible for COVID-19 research today. And we have a model, which we call the Ubuntu-based bioinnovation model. It's a holistic integral model, which is based on indigenous knowledge. If there's no indigenous knowledge, we don't touch, the, we don't touch that kind of product. We use integral research, meaning that it's various forms of uh, knowledge systems, including social social and um, humanities, uh, inclusive innovation. We work with the knowledge holders hand, hand in hand so every, because everything comes from them. Technology is localized where the knowledge comes from. We train them, we organize them into SMMEs, and then we promote conscious commercialization of this product. And of course, in terms of what we're doing at the moment, we, we have collected up to um, 20 South African medicines um, and what we do is that we, we do agronomy. So we grow these things to check how they, they're supposed to grow. We also check what are the active ingredients, but they should work in synergy. We don't look for single molecules. We do various in vitro and in vivo studies and of course clinical re research according to the World Health Organization. And actually I must also mention that we are chairing the WHO Afro uh, Regional Expert Committee as South Africa, my team is chairing that, that group um, and we're providing leadership in the African continent in terms of how we're supposed to do research on African, on African medicines. And what is it that we're looking for? We're looking for antiviral uh, therapies. These are the medicines that will kill the coronavirus. Immune modulators, these are the medicines that will change something in the body for the virus not to infect one. Immune boosters, these are just your immune systems um, are boosting uh, our remedies. Nutraceuticals, these are various food products, but they've got healing uh, uh, properties. And of course, various food uh, and health supplements. This is what we're looking at and we're making great strides at the moment. Unfortunately, I cannot reveal what kind of herbs we're using because I don't want people to start hitting the bush and uh, exterminate the herbs just as we've just done with Mflonyan. Um, uh, as I conclude, um, uh, sorry, I, I, I timed myself. So as I conclude, the, the work that we do, um, we, 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 we want to make an impact and we are already making an impact in that we create jobs from research, for example, in terms of the the scientists themselves and the skills that we, we create in the young scientists that are emerging, but also at community level, we create SMMEs out of the wisdom keepers that we work with. They have agribusinesses. We, we're starting to have a look into uh, production warehouses, retailing and commercialization. So basically we look, we look into the entire value chain whereby you can create jobs throughout, but at the same time, we, we, we get land, we, 
we we appropriating land without compensation compensation but in an effective manner uh, whereby these wisdom keepers indigenous knowledge holders they start owning land they create uh, manufacturing small manufacturing entities they create jobs they alleviate poverty they reverse uh, inequality and like this then we improve the quality of life of our people and the recommendations really uh, maybe for universities um, what I can say it's important, and I've said this, we had a meeting with Northwest University two, two, two weeks ago, I think. What I emphasize to your university, and I think the same will go to Namibia, is that we need to build institutions inside universities, especially IK-based institutes, whereby everyone who's working on IKS needs to work together. We can't have a situation where um, the natural scientists and the social scientists and the humanities work, work in silos. What we're trying to forge as a department is that whoever we're working with, your university, Venda, UKZ, and Free State, um, Zululand, wherever there is IKS, including the science, the science councils, we're trying to foster that we have institutes. And some of you might have had the minister, our minister um, in Zimande, talking about this institute that we're pulling together. Uh, and this will focus strictly on medicines, nutraceuticals, and cosmeceuticals. Uh, the others, um, like trade and industry, we need black owned entities, manufacturing industries and companies. That's what we're trying to do. We're working on that with the IDC. Already we have established a program at the IDC, which is looking into that. And with regard to funding, we have now a unit at the Technology Innovation Agency, which will then take care of everything research. Um, uh, you might have seen that the NRF canceled a call on indigenous knowledge systems. So those kind of calls will be run from the, from the, NR, from the tier uh, as from now onwards. Uh, and of course, we're working with SAPRA um, for the registration of this, uh, of this medicine. Thank you so much. Um, these are some of our colleagues, uh, the UFS, UKZ, and CSIR, Pretoria University Agricultural Research Council, uh, the Traditional Health uh, Practitioners Organization, Nupaza and Mutung. These are the core um, uh, organizations under the African Medicines Platform. However, there are other platforms on the cosmetics, on the food, on tech transfer, and on commercialization. Some of them overlap but it's a huge movement that we have with over 130 uh, organizations already in the country, um, uh, including indigenous knowledge systems. I will also invite you to go into the BioAfrica Convention website. We'll be having a digital convention. This, mm -hmm. is, the, this is the biggest science um, convention on the African continent following the science forum. We often have it in August, but this time we'll have a digital one uh, in the next two, three weeks. So I invite you to register for that. And my apologies that I took a little bit of four minutes. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, um, Dr. Shabalala. It's mind blowing uh, presentation. I'm thrilled that we really integrated this series with the presentation. I'm, I'm really excited that it's talking directly to issues that we, we, we want to grapple with here. What it means for Africa, for us to reflect um, on our experience, to acknowledge our experience, and to also share our experience with the rest of the world. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm really, um, uh, my mind is blown away. I hope, every, I'm sure everybody else is. is. Um, there is a series of questions um, in the Q&A um, box. I'll try and read those. I don't know if um, Dr. Shabalala, those are reflecting on you, so, but I, I can try and read them. Um, I'll, I'll try and, and uh, if you can try, if you can to be as, 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 as quick as possible, we would like to go through all of them. The first one, is scenario 201 uh, of the Bill Gates Foundation being implemented? The first question from Masemula. Paul? Uh, should, should, I, should I respond 
one by one or you want you want to how, how do you want to take it do i need to read three of them uh the things they're not related so i can read three at a time would that be fine maybe three. uh then okay. whilst i'm responding you you can check on the other on the others yeah okay so that's the first one the second one um i think the next one is a comment it says very good to learn about the genius who treated many conditions okay where was he from based in terms of African geographical area. Um, I think that there were quite a few names there that you mentioned um, uh, who were medical practitioners. I'm not sure what this one is referring to particularly. And the next one from Pesi is, thank you for the presentation so far. May you comment on the role or the potential role of witchcraft on human development? Let's take those three. Um, thank, thank you so much. Uh, is scenario 201 of the Bill Gates Foundation being implemented? I, I don't know. I don't work with, um, with, with Bill Gates uh, Foundation. Um, uh, our work is strictly on African medicines. So, so I know that the, the uh, Bill Gates Foundation uh, it's, it's focusing more on um, single molecule uh, therapeutics, uh, what you'll call Western medicines, and also the, the vaccines. Um, uh, what I know is that the, 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 the other health research sec se sector or se uh, uh, group is already implementing the vaccine trials in South Africa. I know that there are many other countries on the African continent that have uh, actually agreed to being part of the solidarity um, endeavor to test various, uh, various vaccines or whatever medicines that uh, those groups that are working into allopathic, looking to allopathic medicines will be um, uh, actually testing. However, uh, in terms of African natural medicines, we don't work with the um, uh, uh, Bill Gates Foundation. Um, we will be working with the Beijing University of Chinese Medicine. Uh, they are our partner. Um, uh, and as you know, as you will know, China, Korea, India are very, very advanced when it comes to natural medicines. They have universities and they have hospitals up to tertiary level. So, so what we have been doing is to collaborate with the Indians, the Koreans, and the Chinese to actually do comparative studies. Like we, we give them our herbs, they give us their herbs, and we do comparative studies to see which of these herbs are working better for whatever health condition. And in this case, we'll also be looking into COVID-19 COVID uh, in, in the next couple of uh, months, um, should SAPRA um, approve our clinical trial protocols. So we'll have some of the African medicines going through uh, through the clinical trials. Um, where, where those people that I was talking about come from, they, they all came from um, what you will know today as, as ancient Egypt. Uh, and of course, ancient Egypt is not the same as the modern, modern day Egypt. Ancient Egypt um, uh, went all the way down into what is known as the Sudan today. However, it was a, it was a dual um, it was a dual empire. Uh, so we had what was called Tameri of or, or Lower Kemet, which is the north part, and then um, Taseti, which is um, on the side on this on the southern part, which we call Upper Kemet. Um, uh, and these people were Africans, and of course later on, um, uh, especially from the I would say from the, the 13th dynasty, we're talking almost uh, 19, 1900 uh, BC, there was a little bit of, a, of an invasion by the people called the Hyksoses. The Hyksoses or the Hakka Kasus, these are the people that came from the Levant, like from Saudi Arabia, uh, the Hittites in Turkey. They ruled for 100, 200 years and naturally then they were admixtures. That's why if you look into the Sudan, into Rwanda, 
Ethiopia, you'll find that these people have um, certain uh, phenotypes, certain features that look a little bit uh, Arabic. However, um, uh, you know that the African gene is, is, is stronger. As I demonstrated, they were over 90% sub-Saharan, they had over 90% sub-Saharan gene. Um, and we can also demonstrate that their ancestors actually came all the way from, from the South. And today we're doing some work to demonstrate the connection between Southern African nations and um, that part of the, of the world around that time. Today, my gene and your gene, if you are Southern African, is the same as them, um, uh, especially the ones that came from the royal families. Later on, um, around 500 BC, then basically Egypt fell, started falling because the text came in, followed by the Greeks, then followed by the, by the, by the Arabs later. And what we have in Egypt today is basically mainly the text and the Arabic people, and you have got admix of the Greeks and the, and the Italians, and of course, some of the European people, um, uh, especially around Cairo and the North. But if you go down Egypt, you find people like me and you, um, uh, the Afar, the Himba, the Bija people, uh, these are like, you know, brothers and sisters from the, from the, from the rest of the South, uh, um, South, South, Sub-Saharan Africa, basically. Um, the role of witchcraft, um, I can't speak on witchcraft because it's something that I cannot scientifically demonstrate that um, uh, there is something like that. For me, witchcraft is it's simple. It's when you just have bad mind, bad heart, bad soul, bad spirit. Um, that's what I'll call witchcraft. However, within, within the African knowledge systems, as I practice it, and as I teach and as I research, um, all these things are lumped together. It, they were lumped together as witchcraft. What we're talking about, the South African government even had a law which says whatever we're practicing as Sangomas or Inyangas is witchcraft. Um, uh, so, so everything, every other issue that people like talking about or accusing others of is really just, just bad mind, evil mind. And this, you can find it everywhere <laughs> in academia. If, if you talk about dog eat dog in academia, then that's witchcraft. If one professor doesn't want another professor to succeed, that's witchcraft. I feel we need, as Africans, we need to, to elevate our thinking and also elevate um, our knowledge system and not really use the languaging that was actually uh, enforced on us to actually then uh, taint this beautiful knowledge system with all these things that were really foreign to us. Thank you so much. The questions are just flowing. We have um, just over 16 questions now that, that have come up. I'm really not sure how to manage this. Um, we, I think I'm just going to, I'm going to be selective colleagues, you, 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 you will um, forgive me. Um, the, I want to start with the, with the last one that I, I, I feel is important here. It's from a student uh, from um, Namibia, and she's asking, she's saying she's a first year um, medical sciences student and would like to know if there are opportunities to join. Um, your institute in the future. And then um, uh, the next one um, is from um, Gift. It says, is it safe to say that traditional medicines were used in an ancient pandemics, in ancient pandemics because there were no regulatory bodies like WHO? And if this is the case, what are you doing as IKS practitioner to promote equity? in the reception and, use, and usage of traditional medicine vis-a-vis -vis Western medication at both the global and local levels. Uh, I just want to... So can, can you take those two? I'm, I'm trying to establish what do we do with time with the rest of the team so far. Okay. Um, yeah, to the, 
to the student, to the student from Namibia. Well, the, there are many, there are many ways in which you can study indigenous knowledge systems. In South Africa, the Northwest University, this university has a Bachelor of Indigenous Knowledge System. And one of the, one of the streams is on innovation uh, and of course, indigenous health or indigenous health systems. Um, and there are, other, there are other fields in terms of environment, agriculture, arts and law. We are hoping to expand um, uh, this, um, uh, these streams uh, um, moving forward. With regards to the elevation of Af African medicines, the, there are various initiatives that are going on um, in, in my country, uh, in South Africa. Uh, I, I cannot speak for other African countries, but what I know is that there is a huge movement on the African continent to actually elevate African medicines, just as um, India, China, Korea, Japan, um, you know, the Oriental Asia, Asian countries have done, uh, including some of the countries like your Germany, France, uh, homeopathy, which is their traditional medicine. It's, 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 a, it's a normal official health system. So what we're doing in South Africa, uh, of course, from the science-based part, what we thought we should um, prioritize is the, is, the, um, is the registration of these medicines so that they form part of the essential medicines list or what is called the essential drug list. When medicines are part of the essential drug list, they can then be used in hospitals and in clinics, but also they can be commercialized if one opens um, a pharmacy or, or a health shop, then one can, can sell these products uh, and also can uh, actually export to other health systems in other countries. That's what we're looking at. And how do we do, do this? So we're working with SAPRA 1 to come up with a policy which will then regulate pr proprietary medicines, like really health products. I'm not talking about the practice of healers within their own spaces. I'm talking the finished products um, that would have gone through research and development, uh, through the various tests, including clinical trials, wherever possible. Not every product needs to go through clinical trials. What we need out of these products is quality, is safety, is efficacy, meaning that they do what we say they do, but they should be safe, but also they should be of good quality. That's what we're looking at. In terms of the, the institute, we hope that we'll actually link together all the partners, the partner universities and science councils, so that we have a seamless move of one research product from basic research all the way to commercialization. I've already mentioned that we have established a program at the IDC, this is the Industrial Development Cooperation of South Africa, which will be looking into um, uh, SMME support, supporting the small medium enterprises, that's one, but also looking into uh, world-class large-scale manufacturing of these products. That's what we are actually working on at the moment. We have some budgets. Um, what is in place? We have over 35 small medium enterprises that have been established by, by our program. All of them trained as entrepreneurs, registered. They have products that, that have been researched. The, they are manufacturing and they're actually commercializing. If you come, if you join the bio, digital bio Africa convention, you will see some of them, they will come there to actually um, uh, 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 present and showcase their products. The Department of Health uh, is then looking into, and it's their responsibility to look into uh, how can we then start having proper clinics and uh, clinics and hospitals, whereby um, uh, besides the, the process of Ubunyanga or to be a traditional healer, so that we, we then start using these medicines within the clinical setting. That's what is happening in the country. It's a long journey, um, uh, but we want to do these things properly. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Dr. Um, 
Um, colleagues, we, 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 it's half past um, now, we, we're running out of time, and they, there's many, many questions. I just want to need direction, I, I need direction here. Uh, th there's two ways where we can uh, record the questions and then um, ask uh, Dr. Ankwe if he's got time, Dr. Chaba, when he's got time to respond to these. Um, and I think it would be a good um, record for us as well. But we're not going to have time now to really look through um, all of these. Maybe just the, the, the one last one that um, I would like you to respond to. Um, Dr. Kiran Odab has asked quite a few questions. Um, one is that how, how did it come to be that the South African or the Koi have the genetic material of all the groups of the world? Um, I think that's that one. And the other one uh, that I would like you to address briefly is someone asking about this distinction between indigenous um, and African. Uh, to describe the systems of the origina originating in one part of the globe. Uh, just those two, and then we can wrap up. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, how come do the koi or the sun or the koi have the genetic material of all groups of the world? Um, what I know is that the, the, the genetic marker of the koi it's um, it's what we call I think it's the LO genetic marker, which then mutates and become the other genetic markers that I I, I mentioned, and the koi is um, part of the some of the 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 most ancient not only koi but koi and sun um, uh, uh, as part of some of the most ancient of the people. Uh, their genetic marker is basically the basis of um, of uh, uh, whatever other genetic markers that appeared after that. And it's not only the koi. It's it's if you go up up to Gabon, you find you find um, uh, uh, people different phenotype, but also people who were also short hunter gatherers. Um, uh, they are also of a, of a related genetic marker. Uh, if you look, also if you look into the coffin of Imhotep that I spoke about, Imhotep was actually a Mutwa as well. The coffin is, is literally very short, uh, and his statue as well, you can see that it was, it was very short. However, I think it's important to also uh, mention that there has been, there is the whole thing, the whole uh, theory of simultaneous arrival. Um, so, so what does that mean? When you look into the evolution of, of humanity, I think Professor Schobe, you, you will help me here. Uh, there are those who are saying that the, you find some of the most ancient um, archaic human beings in, in, in Morocco, just as you find some in, 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 the, in the horn of the African continent, and we have our own as well. So, so when it comes to a homo sapien, you can't really say, you can't point, pinpoint that a homo sapien actually emerged in one area. Um, uh, uh, they, they just sprang out from, from everywhere on the African continent. And of course, then they spread out in other, in other part of the world and mutations happened. And some of them come back and then this is how you then have admixtures. So, so in my genes, you may find that um, I'm 1% Arabic, I'm 0.5% maybe Italian, that is possible because there was there were those admixtures and the same thing with our koi and sun nama to where uh, they mix a lot with people who came from the european countries and also in namibia is the same thing so you find all these admixtures it's not only in the koi and the sun most of us have a number of gene in us um, maybe i should also just mention a little bit i see i see one question on medical cannabis Yes, the, the, the country has a, we have, we, we, we're working on what we call a presidential master plan on medical cannabis. Um, uh, and of course, previously, previously, a lot of work was done on hemp. This is the other form of cannabis, which doesn't give you a high. It has got low THC. However, with regards to medical cannabis, already we have started doing some work. 
Um, we also have a consortium, but the pre presidential master plan uh, is led by the Department of Agriculture. We are responsible for, for research and development, of course, but then small, small business development unit is looking into you know, the growers, you know, all those mothers who have been growing this for, for hundreds of years, how to organize them into SMME so that they become official traders. The DTI is looking into industrialization, especially black industrialists. Then um, Department of Health with SAPRA are looking into the regulations, uh, especially when it comes to the medicines themselves. And then there is a group which looks into the social aspects like the police health, Department of Social Development, um, looking into the issues of legalization, uh, but education in terms of, you know, the concerns from social sector uh, of the abuse and mixing it with other with other substances. So, so, so there is there is work that is happening. Um, uh, uh, we're also looking at it at it in terms of COVID, not through smoking. We looking into the essence. Uh, so people shouldn't go smoking cannabis, hoping that they will cure COVID. Um, we're not doing that. So, so, so yes, we're doing work on cannabis. Yeah, other questions. Uh, it's a lot of questions, but other questions. I'm happy to 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 respond to 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 those who actually pose them. If you send me an email, then I will actually engage with them um, on the site. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Shabalala. So there is an opportunity, colleagues, um, the, the team, we will copy the questions, um, uh, just type them up nicely and send them to Prof, uh, to Dr. Uh, Shabalala, and then we can distribute them to, to the attendees um, of the um, webinar. I, I just want to quickly, I'm, 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 I'm not going to wrap up. I, I, I think I will, I will I, this has been so well presented, um, great engagement um, with the attendees. And so I just want to get an indication um, if the poet um, is here, Frida uh, Makuta. Frida, are you here? Whilst I'm reading your CV, I just quickly, um, Frida was born um, in on Onomuolo um, in Namibia and um, holds a master's degree in English and Applied Linguistics. Um, from NAST, is a poet who has created her own identity as a performer at Open Mic Namibia, which is a platform given to poets to showcase their talent. She currently writes for the New Era newspaper, where she has a column on women's um, issues. She's a feminist and an activist on women empowerment issues, as well as social issues, and is kind of currently operating under the name Dem E2 on Twitter, she has been vocal on women's issues ranging from petitions for abortions, gender justice for women who have endured gender-based violence, as well as being part of movements such as Slut Shame Walk. As an advocate for gender rights, she has aired her opinions on related social issues, included, including youth safety, uh, social cohesion, cohesion, and accountability. Frida's activism is not subject to affiliation to any political party or employer, but her views are those of an observant, witty, and funny young Namibian who is interested in the progression of women. She currently runs a language consult consultancy as an editor and copywriter, and um, has also been part of some discussions, uh, such as discussions by UNESCO on preserving indigenous languages, um, poet on mental health awareness campaign at NAST and moderator um, at the HIV and AIDS campaign at NAST. Um, Paul, I'm not sure if we have uh, Frida or we're going to also play the recording of, his, of her performance. Good afternoon. My piece is titled, When Did He Become Mine? My rapist. Why do we say my rapist? Why is it still a part of my narrative? Why does it still have access into my dialogues? Why does it still have a space within my vocabulary? Why do I use such a lighter pronoun when talking about how heavy of a burden he left me with? Why do my sentences not form fully enough to have a morpheme of his name? 
Why can the words rolling off my tongue not use other vowel pronouns? Why is it always my rapist? Why is it that there's no easy narrative to this? Why do I always have to choke when recollecting memories? Why does my throat burn with anger and hurt every time I say my? Does he belong to me? What part of him belongs to me? What part of his resides within me? What part of his is left with me? Why is he mine? I say my rapist like I'm proud to call him mine. I am forced to say my rapist because it's double rape now. It identifies who I am. He makes up my identity. In society, I cannot exist without the help of my rapist. It's forever going to be Frida, the raped girl. Never him, the rapist. Why do I have to suffer the double oppression? Why do I have to carry my story with my rapist? Why can my scars and trauma not exist independently? Why is it always attached to him, making him mine? Someone I never asked to own. Someone I never wanted to own. Why is he always accompanied by my anger? Why does he feel how I feel? Why is it that he is attached to my memories? Why is he mine? Friend, isn't that your rapist? What makes him mine? Is it because he left me broken and possibly only his apology can fix me? Is it because he's seen the inside of me more than myself to possibly become one with my soul that he walked away with? Is it because he was the first person to have seen the insides of me? A place I preserved for when I was ready, a place I regarded holy. Is it mine because he took my voice and in that moment I could not scream? Is it because I still do not have the courage to speak up and tell my story that she remains mine? Is it because his hands carried strength over my body that he repossessed it to make it his and now we are one? Why is he mine? When did he become mine? Is it because I'm the only one that remembers? Is because my memories exist because of him. What did I do to deserve him being a part of me? Was it my vagina that invited him in? Was it my curves that lured him? Was it my existence? Why is he mine? Is being a woman a curse? After all that he did to me, why is he mine? Is because my second oppressor says I was made from his rib. Is because religion says I am because God is and God is a man. Is because we are conditioned to worship men that we make them a part of us. Why is he mine? Why is it my rapist? Why isn't there a different narrative to it? Why isn't there another pronoun to use? Who said I want him to be mine? Who said I want him to be associated with me? Is it mine because he was my friend before? Is it mine because he gave birth to me? Is it mine because he helped raise me and change my diapers? Or is it mine because he said he knows how to make me graduate? Why is he mine? Is it mine because he is the reason for my silent cries? Why is he my rapist? Thank you. Wow. Uh, I have no words. Uh, thank you so much, um, Frida, uh, for that uh, great, really, really good. Thank you so much, um, everybody. I, I now want to just thank everybody um, on, on my part as I disappear and I get um, Dr. Motero Koitiwe uh, to um, address us as the last um, uh, speaker here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Dr. Motel? Um. Good uh, afternoon, uh, colleagues, um, on this uh, very important day. Um, my job uh, this afternoon is a very simple one. Uh, I've been asked to come and thank um, everybody who has participated here and just to uh, close this uh, a very important uh, inaugural uh, research webinar series as a collaboration between uh, Northwest University and NAST. Uh, Bahai Su and colleagues, um, uh, I'm not working alone. And Professor Pamela Maseko, Professor Sehojwe, we had a very powerful team, uh, which also included uh, people from uh, corporate uh, relations and marketing led by Auskoni, uh, Jani, and uh, other people, um, uh, Rembata. And there's also other colleagues uh, who came with Professor Sehojo from uh, Namibia, Dr. Teach, 
and the rest of the people, uh, which include uh, Dr. Amwele. And from the IKS Center also, I was not alone. There was uh, Dr. Munna Ruri, who also participated effectively in this event. So uh, as part of the organizing team, uh, and I also want to thank my colleagues at the IKS Center uh, for also supporting and also embracing this, uh, Professor Aremo, uh, Prof. Matere Chera, and um, other uh, PhD students that we work with, Boremona Ere, and, uh, and other people that we work with, Renkofu and um, Majiti, other students that we work with. So colleagues, I also want to thank uh, our management. Uh, I see Professor uh, uh, Franz, who was with us at the beginning. And uh, I also heard that our um, executive dean, Professor Mudise, is also here, and other uh, members of the dean are well, Professor Midupi, and uh, our students from um, the IKS Center, and even those who come from uh, Namibia, and uh, others who join from uh, our stakeholders group. So, colleagues, um, uh, the highlight, if you can listen to the presentations of today, was just about the uh, archives and the uh, historiography and knowledge systems. And I think we have learned a lot that actually we need to embrace all alternative knowledge systems, African, Asian, and also European, so that we can have that complementarity of knowledge systems, because there is no knowledge which is superior uh, to another one. And as IKS, as social scientists, as uh, people in humanities, we embrace interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity in terms of approaching the challenges that are facing us on the ground. And also the highlight was about African traditional health practitioners and uh, how they've been dealing with the pandemics in the past and what archives are we having in the system? Uh, what was the role of archives in the construction of knowledge systems because uh, history is about um, those events that happened in the past, but historiography, uh, it highlights the methods of historians which they used when they were crafting history, the, the theories, what kind of epistemology influenced them when they were doing this. And I also want to thank uh, Professor um, Dr. Ann Chabalala from the Department of Science and Innovation. I think um, he has embraced the very uh, same topic very well. Uh, or this uh, focus area of archives, uh, historiography, and knowledge systems. So, Bahai, so in a nutshell, let me say thank you very much um, for your support. Uh, we still have other events coming. The next one, I think it will be next week, uh, Thursday, at the same time. But uh, just look across uh, within the social spaces, uh, the social media, and the other. Um, ICT platforms where you will hear us. Thank you very much, colleagues. I wouldn't like uh, to do a presentation, but was just to thank everybody, well, Memo Hadi, uh, other people that we have worked with, well, Dr. Tandai, and everybody, colleagues. I will not um, forget uh, Mucholoko, uh, Zulumatabo, Togoza Makozi. <laughs> thank you very much also for your, for your work. <clears throat>